He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the wings of the Almighty. We thank you, O God, for the promise of your protection and your presence in the time of trouble. There are many a testimony today of those who know that you have hidden us in troubled times. We thank you now, O God, that you desire to speak to us and we desire to listen and be fed. We pour out our cup of our own desires that you might speak your will, that we might overflow, that we might find ourselves rendering our life to you as a gift that is holy and acceptable in your sight. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, we do pray. Amen. This morning, quickly and briefly, I want you to re-examine with me what I believe is one of the most powerful and profound passages in the Old Testament. It speaks a lesson to us about being prepared for the work and the things that God has in store for us. It comes to us in one of my favorite books of the Bible, the book of Joshua. And in the fifth chapter, there is a very peculiar occurrence in the story of the life of the children of Israel that oftentimes escapes our hearing and our understanding, but it speaks volumes to how God moves in and among us. In Joshua, the fifth chapter, beginning in the 10th verse, I want to read out the New King James Version and invite those who are able to stand as together we reverence the reading of God's word. One of my favorite passages of scripture, Joshua chapter 5, beginning in verse number 10. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. They ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land. The children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. Then the manna ceased. I want to talk today about when the manna stops. You may be seated in the presence of God. The book of Joshua, when you go home and read it, you'll find it really tells two stories. It's the story of how the children of Israel came to conquest the land of Canaan, the promised land, and how they began to spread out and what they would then and even to this day identify as a plot and the piece of earth that had been promised to them by the Lord. But the underlying message that I believe makes the book of Joshua so profound and so worthy of our attention because of the message that it iterates from chapter one to chapter last. And that is simply a message that we all ought to hang our hat of hope on every day of our life. The message that comes to us repeatedly from the book of Joshua is this, God is faithful. If you really understood that, you'd probably say amen at least one more time. Because what we see unfold in the chapters of Joshua is God bringing to fruition a promise that God had made some 500 years prior to Joshua that this land of Canaan would one day be inhabited by and inherited by the descendants of Abraham. And that promise made some 500 years prior to Joshua if you read from the time of Abram receiving it in the early onset of Genesis to Joshua bringing it to fruition, you'll find that throughout that journey, continuously, this promise is put in peril. But in every moment of this promise being in peril and in jeopardy, God proves himself faithful and makes a way out of no way. It's in danger when Abraham is called to sacrifice Isaac. But God is faithful and places a ram in the bush and the promise yet lives. 
The promise is put in jeopardy when Esau wants to kill Jacob. But God is faithful and transforms Jacob at a place called Peniel and the promise keeps on living. The promise is in jeopardy when Joseph is thrown in a pit by his brothers, but God is faithful. He takes him out the pit, puts him in the palace, and the promise yet lives on. The promise is in jeopardy when after centuries of slavery, there arises a Pharaoh who knows not Joseph nor God, and it seems like he is unwilling to relent and release the children of Israel out of bondage, but God is faithful. Rises up of Moses with a prophetic voice with signs and wonders that forces Pharaoh to let them go. The promise is in jeopardy when they get to the Red Sea and there seems to be no way, but God is faithful. God makes way out of no way and leads them out of bondage on their journey to a place of promise. And even after they come out of Egypt, that promise is put in peril because God finds out then that these are some of the most disobedient disciples you'd ever want to know in life. As a matter of fact, they are so disobedient and rebellious that the Bible gives them a term reserved for disobedient folk called stiff neck. Every journey, every turn of the journey, they rebel against God. They lead a mutiny against Moses. They worship false gods. They want to go back to Egypt. They want to hire somebody to replace Moses to take them back to Egypt. And just like good suntan folk, they complain about everything. Sun is too hot, too cold at night. The water's too bitter, the food ain't seasoned right. We want some meat, we don't like Moses. Didn't nobody vote on that? That wasn't brought up at the meeting. Who told him he could do that? And there ain't nothing but trouble. But yet in spite of their stiff-necked behavior, here they are in the book of Joshua at the boundary of the promised land for one reason. God is faithful. And there was no problem or peril or even level of disobedience that could challenge the promise that God had made. Matter of fact, let me tell you right there, you ought to write your second amen. Because it's a reminder to us, no matter how many obstacles we face, no matter how many people stand against us, and no matter how low you sink in life, God is faithful to perform what God has promised. And if God said he would do it, I come by to tell you there's nothing that will prevent our God from doing what God says he's going to do. As a matter of fact, let me just holler. Are there some stiff-necked folk in Alpha Street who know that in spite of your stiff-necked behavior, God still did what he said he was going to do? It still worked together for your good. The weeping only endured for a night. That your enemies became your footstool. That God met your every need. Why? Because God is faithful. No, somebody tell them, I know that's right. As you watch this faithful God, you'll find the issue, Ed, was never God's faithfulness, but rather the people's preparedness. God had a promise ready for them, only to find out they weren't ready for it. And so as you read through the journey of the children of Israel from bondage to promise, you'll find, Mary, that it really is a story about preparation. That everything God is doing on this journey is literally preparing them for the promise that they can't escape. Because God is faithful. So he leads them by a pillar of cloud and day and a pillar of fire by night. That they may learn to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. He shields them from their enemies that would do them harm. So that they may know the Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? He brings water out of a rock to teach them that with God, all things are possible. Our brothers and my sisters, and the greatest lesson of preparation that God gives these children who are wandering in the wilderness is the lesson of manna. 
this food that descended from heaven every day. That when they were wandering and wondering how they would make it and where their provision would come from and how they would be sustained in their journey, every morning God sent something to remind them that I'm not just a God who works in marvelous, majestic miracles, but I'm the God who provides for you every day. And I don't want you just to worship me in mountaintop sea opening moments, but I want you to realize that every day there are resources that show up in your life because I am a daily bread kind of God. Can I just pause? Because I believe that too often in church, Deacon Johnson, we reserve our praise for God to these marvelous, majestic things that we need God to open up the heavens and God to move the mountains and God to answer these major prayers when God says, I'm looking for some folk who walk in and know that even if the sea hadn't been opened and the door hadn't been opened, that there's some daily bread that you ought to be thankful for. I need some folk who know that today already he's done something that's worthy of some thanksgiving, that he's provided daily bread. Ah, y'all. Don't, don't make me preach hard. You know I got to open Hampton tomorrow. Listen, listen. He, he provides his daily bread, and they call it manna. Now, some of you Bible students who've been with us a while know that manna, ma manna, Deacon Lorraine, really in, in the now, it's not something, it's, it's not a name. Manna is a question. A, an accurate translation of manna, Dr. Judy Finch Williams, is a, a what is it? <laughs> that, that, that's really what manna means because. God provided it in the middle of their uncertainty and all they could wonder was, what is it? Because when you're uncertain of how it's going to happen and the Lord provides it anyway, the only thing you ought to be able to holler is manna. Can I pause? Is anybody here today early in the sermon know that there have been some moments, don't fool me now, when the Lord has provided for you and you had no clue that it was even on the way. No, 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 I need some folk who know that God has done some things and there was no explanation of how and why God did what he did. And if you know that, then you ought to be able to holler, manna. When he made a way out of no way, manna. When he gave you the job and you didn't even put in a resume, Manna. When the check showed up in the mail, you didn't even know they owed you money. Manna. Somebody that you know about manna, that the Lord has done some things that, that literally left you scratching your head. How did God do this? Manna. They didn't know what it was, but that's the kind of God we serve. That in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of not knowing, in the midst of worrying and wondering, God has a way of providing that leaves you scratching your head. Manna. They've been eating this manna for some 40 years now. It's a long time. And when they get to the promised land, Moses passes. Joshua takes over. They're getting ready to invade Jericho. They've come over the Jordan. They're about to have the infamous battle with Jericho and all they got to do is shout and the walls come down. The Bible says that before they make that move, something miraculous happens. God stops the manna. Not out of punishment, but out of preparation. You're about to walk into your promise. I've got to stop the manna. You're about to find out how faithful I really am. 
I've got to stop the manna. You're about to move into what I declared would be 500 years ago. And the Lord says, in order to prepare you for where you're about to go, I need to stop the manna. Now, now Lord, why are you going to do that? This is what and how you've been providing for 40 years. And now, no manna? Why does the Lord stop it? Let me drop a few ideas on you. Take them home, marinate, and preach them to somebody else. He said, listen. I've got to stop the manna, because in order for you to move into the next place, I've got to put a new desire in your mouth. I've got to cause you to want something different than what you've had. Okay, 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 okay. Can, 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 I, can I just stretch out for a little bit? Um, my, um, very recently, uh, I've shared with you all, I try to be proactive in, in health. I've changed my diet. I gave up beef and, and pork and fried foods. <laughs> and see, you know, you know already, because I'm a black preacher, <laughs> that changing your diet is one of the hardest things you'll ever do because your diet is linked to your desire. Your diet is an expression of what you hunger for. And so the Lord says, children of Israel, the reason I've got to change your diet is because I've got to change the desire of your heart for you to want something different than what you've become accustomed to. Watch this. The trouble God has with these children of Israel is always made manifest in what they hunger for. While they're walking through the wilderness, this is what they say to Moses when they want to go back to Egypt. They continuously say, we liked the food in Egypt. And we don't like manna and bitter water. We want what we used to eat. And so their diet was an expression of their desire. And what they ate in Egypt, watch this, saints, they say, we want the garlic and the onion. Come on, I want you to be biblically literate. The diet in Egypt was heavy on garlic and onion. That is the diet of bondage, garlic and onion. Let me just pause and be pastor and be prophetic for a minute and tell you that folk, who have a diet heavy in garlic and onion have a foul odor to them whenever they begin to speak. And you can tell folk who are still bound in Egypt because every time they open their mouths, something foul and offensive comes out and it's showing you where they're still connected to. God's trying to do something new. They always criticizing, always complaining, always fussing, always questioning who said they could do this and do what. Something foul comes out of their mouth because they're still in bondage. Do me a favor, look at your neighbor. Are you in bondage? So, the Lord has been giving them manna to try to change their desire for bondage. But now, watch the transition, they move into the beginning of the promised land, and the Bible says that the Lord cuts off the manna after they eat of the fruit of the land. They've gone from garlic and onion to manna, and now the fruit. The Lord says, now I'm trying to transition you to want something even better than manna, which is the fruit that's better than garlic and onion. Garlic and onion is pungent. Fruit is sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, say, say with me, say with me. Says, so I'm trying to change your desire to want something better. Now, now, I came here with a little Sunday school preparation. I was reading my Bible. And you'll find, Judy, this is the second time they've tasted 
the fruit of the land. Come here, Bible students. Numbers 13, they send spies in. And the spies come back with some fruit of the land. This is the second time they've tasted the fruit. And the Lord says, here was the problem the first time. Stay with me. I want you to catch this. The first time you ate it, you treated it like a sample. This time, it's an appetizer. Okay, okay, you, okay, it's, it's gonna sink in. You've had it before, but you thought it was a sample. And now I need you to see it's an appetizer. Yeah. Reason your neighbor's quiet, because they ain't on no difference between sample and appetizer. <laughs> when you go to Costco, they give you a sample. That's it, keep on moving. When you go to a restaurant, they give you an appetizer, which is to say when you taste it, don't get up and leave, because that's not the end of the meal. That's just the beginning of the meal, and it's meant to whet your appetite for you to desire what the cook still has waiting for you in the kitchen. I don't know who I can to drop this on, but every blessing of God is not a sample that you walk away from. It is an appetizer that's meant to wet your palate for something greater that God has in store for you. I wish I had somebody who just believed that more was on the way, that better was coming down the road, that greater has been ordered, and God has more on the way. God says, the question, do you just want that little bit? Do you want the fullness of what I have coming? What do you really hunger for? I don't want just a sample. I want the full meal. Now, now here's the issue. The issue that Jesus picks up when he talks about this manna in the Gospel of John is to suggest that the problem of the children of Israel is that all they wanted was the manna, but nothing more. Do you want more than just enough? The question Jesus asks is, <laughs> there's no easy way to put it, I'm just throwing it out there. What do you desire from God after you've gotten what you need from God? Let, let that marinate, here it is. The manna was what you needed just to get by. But do you desire anything greater than just enough of your needs being met? Everybody wants God when they need God. I, I, I mean, there's two folk on your pew right now who are here because they need something. You need the Lord to show up. You need the Lord to answer prayer. And you hope the Lord's taking attendance today. Here I am, God. Your turn. <laughs> but to grow into the place of promise, the Lord says, I need you to hunger for more than just need. Do you have any desire for God when God has already met your needs? Do you desire holiness? Do you hunger after righteousness? Do you thirst for a deeper, intimate relationship with God? Or do you only come to God when the bills are overdue? And the child is prodigal. And they laying off at the job. Is your desire for God greater than your need for God? What do you hunger for? He says, so listen, I've got to change it because I've got to put a new, uh, I've got to put a new desire in your mouth. He says, watch this with number two. I got to stop the manna because I got to put a new demand on your faith. Hear me, brothers and sisters. I, I don't want to shout this. I want to teach it. You cannot go to new levels with God with the same faith you had. Every new level of God requires a new level of faith in God because faith is that key that unlocks the door for the next place that God has prepared for you and if you can only trust God at this level that's the level you'll stay God will never usher you into a place that's greater than your faith in who he is so listen 
I need to put a new demand on your faith because the faith you operated with with manna in the wilderness is not the kind of faith that's going to sustain you in the promised land. So watch, watch the transition. Now you're not going to eat manna. Now you're going to eat fruit. Now here's the difference. The manna just showed up every morning. The fruit will require you taking seeds and planting it in the ground. So you need a faith that knows how to work some seed. Okay, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, Mark. I'm trying to hold up my, my wish. I'm holding my mule. I'm trying to hold my... Look, look. I, I, I don't want you to just always desire everything to show up full-blown from A to Z, pre-packaged. All you got to do is press go. So no, this level of faith requires that you appreciate the gift of a seed and know that if I've got a seed and some faith in God, that that's really all I need to produce the fruit that's going to sustain me. I don't know who this is for. God said, listen, every time you grow in God, it doesn't mean that things get easier and it comes with everything attached to it. No, sometimes all you get is a seed and you got to learn to work the little thing that God has given you. But if you work it, it'll grow something. Can I preach this thing? God says, I'm not going to give you the job. I'm going to give you an interview. But if you work it, it'll turn into something. I'm, I'm not going to put you as a manager. I'm going to start you in the mail room. But if you know how to work it, it'll turn into something. All you got to do is work the seed that God has given you. Uh, would you tell somebody it'll work if you work it? Now, so your faith has got to learn to work because when you grow with God, catch this, when you grow with God, it doesn't get easier. It gets harder. See, that just messed your whole Christianity up because you thought the longer you came to church and the more scriptures you memorized and the more hymns you had underneath your belt that your walk with God would get easier. God says, no, baby, that ain't the way it works. The, the longer you've been with me, the more I expect of your faith to go to work. Watch the movie. Not only do I need a faith that works, but I need a faith that can wait. Because manna showed up every day, but it went away every night. Seeds have to be sown, and you ain't got nothing to do but to wait on the seed you've sown to produce fruit. So here's the Lord says, in the wilderness, you all got used to everything coming within a 24-hour window. Now I've got to see that you've grown to the place where you've got enough faith to endure a waiting season, believing that even if it doesn't show up tomorrow, that I know it's on the way. If it's not easy, if it's not overnight, if it doesn't come without some tribulation, that's all right because my faith knows how Wait on God. Can I tell you how you can tell folk that are growing in Christ? Tell me how you identify mature saints. I'm going to tell you how you know who got out of uh, kindergarten Sunday school on your pew because they've got enough faith to wait on God when it takes time. I don't give up. I don't throw in the towel. I don't wash my hands of God. I don't expect an immediate answer after I say amen that I've got enough faith to believe that God is doing something. Yeah. That my faith, watch this, at this level can endure some no's. Yeah. Right. My faith at this level can survive some dry seasons. My faith at this level can live through folk talking about me. My faith at this level can endure when it does not come easy. It is the immature saint who gives up and quit at the first sign of trouble. But it's the grown maturing woman and the grown maturing man in God who knows that when they don't like me, when I'm talked about, when it's hard, when it's struggle, when it's not productive, I still have enough faith to believe that God is sitting on the throne of heaven and he's working it out for my good. God says you got to have a faith that works and a faith that waits because that's what it takes to move into the next place I have for you. you got to have a new desire in your heart. 
You've got to have a new demand on your faith. Oh, but watch this last one, and I'm done now. He says, and I'm stopping the manna for you to have a new delight in your heart. I want you to rejoice in something more than manna. Watch the text. Bible says the Lord stops the manna after they eat of the fruit of the land and after they've celebrated Passover. I'm not going to stop the manna till you know how to celebrate Passover. Now, now Judy, I'm going to need your help after, after church. We're going to talk about this because I read through my Bible, and this is only the fourth mention of the celebration of Passover in the Bible. And it is the first mention of this generation celebrating Passover. And what I began to understand is the Lord says, I'm going to cut the manna off after you all have come to the place where you can finally celebrate Passover. Now, for the biblically illiterate, let me tell you what Passover is. It's a celebration of what passed over. Okay, 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 okay. I know that's deep and profound. It was them looking back to their days in Egypt when the death angel was sent and every house that was covered by the blood the death angel couldn't even knock on that door. The death angel had to pass over. And so the Lord says, I'm going to stop the manna and give you the fruit when you got enough good sense to pause and realize that the only reason you are where you are is because a little while ago, there was something that should have knocked on your door. But because I kept you, and covered you and protected you there were some things that all they could do do I have anybody here that knows there were some things in your life that God caused to uh, I, I, I'm trying not to go there but there's some things that should have happened that didn't happen that could have happened but didn't happen that might have happened but didn't happen why because the Lord kept you and some things so by the time I know about Passover now 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 so, so what she says I need you to learn to rejoice in that yeah, yeah. now now I'm done here here's because here's the difference between y'all and your predecessors this generation that God is speaking to, that's going in, is not the generation that came out of Egypt. My Bible readers know, that according to the Bible, it's probably only about two of them that came out, Joshua and Caleb. Everybody else, this is not the generation that saw the Red Sea. This is not the generation that knew Pharaoh. These are their children. God says the difference between you all and your mamas and your daddies was that your mamas and your daddies knew Pharaoh. Your mamas and your daddies knew the Red Sea. They knew everything I'd done, and all they did was complain. They knew how good I was, and all they did was complain. They know all the ways I made, and they showed up every Sunday in church and sat like a bump on a log like I'd never done anything for them, and all they could do was get mad that service went too long. So I need some folk who can look back at what I've done and say, if don't nobody else, thank God for that. I know what passed over, and I know what the Lord did for me, and I know where the Lord brought me from, and you can sit there all you want, but when I think of the goodness of God, and when I remember what the Lord has done, hey, hey! Now, now, can I give you the real shout? The, the real shout, and I'm done, Marcus, A flat, amen. The real shout. 
was that this was not the generation that saw it for themselves. They had the audacity to rejoice over something God didn't even do for them. <laughs> I knew that wasn't for everybody. Because everybody on your road don't know how to thank God for what he did for you. It's a selfish saint that can only praise God for their own stuff. But every now and then, when somebody on my road gets happy, it ought to encourage you to stand up. And when somebody asks you, what are you praising God for? Tell them him, her, because I thank God what it did for you. I thank God that it blessed you. Is there anybody here that can get thankful for your neighbor's praise? If you know that you know, nudge your neighbor. Tell them this one is for you. This is because God blessed you. This is because God's been good to you. Hey! Hey, for you. Because you stood up. Because you got happy. Because he answered your prayer. Hey! Hey! Somebody say, no more man. I'm moving you into a new place and a new season. You got to have a new desire. A new desire in your heart, a new demand on your faith, and a new delight in your mouth. Thank you, God. I'm, 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 I'm going somewhere. Hey, 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 hey. I'm sorry, I know, I, know, I know where we are and I know what time it is, but from the time Royal Priesthood led us in praise and worship, I knew it was gonna be that kind of Sunday. Because I'm not the only one that felt the presence of God in this place. Hey! Hey, God. Hey. Just one time, just one time if you don't mind. I know that's not how you made, but just one time stand on your feet. Just one time wave your hand. Just one time tell the Lord, thank you. Just put your
your hands together now and give God, just give him a thank offering, a clap of thanksgiving. God's good. Bless your name, oh God.